So basically where this started was an internship with the city of San Antonio this summer in human services. Social work grad students all do internships somewhere. And a piece of what we do is something called macro, which is look at the super big picture of stuff. And the city does some reporting for the federal government about their block grant, the community services block grant they receive that funds a lot of programs in San Antonio. And not to get into politics, but just be aware that it's a goal of the current administration to wipe out all community services block grants across the entire country. So the question was really to, to figure out whether poverty is distributed across the city or whether it really exists in pockets. And because I'm not really from here, I grew up more close to the Boston area, I've lived in some other big cities, Seattle, the Bay Area, places overseas. I kind of had a concept in my mind of how that works, but not necessarily how San Antonio does. So what I did is I went out to the Census Bureau and I started pulling data for the different zip codes in San Antonio and then stuck them in Excel like a lot of us do and then started sorting them and thought, well, okay, if we're looking at current data for these zip codes, let's see if there's any sort of overlap at the top of things that are performing really well or at the bottom of ones that really are challenged. And so the first three things I looked at, and this was still in Excel, were percent below the poverty level, educational attainment, which they consider high school graduation or a GED, and median household income. And I quickly saw that when you sorted them, it was the same zip codes out of more than 60 in each of those categories. And the high performing ones often had a relationship with the military here, in Military City USA. So everyone graduates from high school before they join the military and they're drawing a salary so those were doing well and it quickly became apparent that the more interesting story was in the lower performing more challenged areas and so after fiddling with this in excel for what seemed like weeks pushed it to tableau which is kind of fortune 500 software for mapping things using excel or other um, databases and while there are several other ways to do this zip code mapping is kind of cool because it's pretty intuitive everyone has a relationship with their zip code and they can visualize it more easily than some of the more specific things that are also out there so anyway this was the eventual map series that was created and it ended up winning an award from Tableau and I'm trying to think um, along the side on the right are these things called sliders, which allow you to dig down into the maps and see, like, okay, I want to see this for education, but I also want to see where the highest percentages below the poverty level are. So it allows you to fiddle with stuff and, and observe in real time how things are going. And not to be a plot spoiler, but the thing that you find is that there's one single area of the city that does well in every metric. We were trying to come up with a name for it, we came up with the crescent of comfort, you know, or the zone of well-being. Let's just say that is not spread equally across the city. So, took a look at, I wonder how this worked a minute ago. Do I need to be a lot closer to it, or did it stall out? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, being a total klutz, I know I'm going to end up tied up with this thing not too soon from now. So this is what San Antonio looks like by population density. Not super interesting, but it's important to know. And then we get to the zip codes below the poverty level. And these are basically heat maps. So wherever you see things more concentrated, it's a higher percentage of people going through that. And there's apparently a joke in public health that no matter how many maps you see, after a while you're still looking at the same map. And if you keep that in mind, you're about to see that with San Antonio. So that's below poverty level. That's where educational attainment is, meaning if you graduated from high school or gotten a GED, you're up in the top crescent, but, not, but two zip codes there in the center completely drop out. That's 78207 and 78237. There's where median household income is best in the city. Per capita income, 
not just how your household's doing, but how you're doing personally. And let me tell you, this is almost an identical map to a different one that's about education distribution in the city, highs and lows. So now it starts getting scary because we know those two things are connected. But here's something else. Remember what this looks like and the comfort of Crescent? That's who passes the third grade reading standard. Ironically, it's the same distribution. Now it gets really difficult. Digging into this, and this whole project, no joke, took about 800 hours, so I consider it my gift to the city of San Antonio. Um, it concerned me that so many people appeared not to even have graduated from ninth grade, so I pulled the census figures and pushed that to a map. That's the map of where people lack more than a ninth grade education in the city, which is actually illegal. So I wanted to then, when you go out to Tableau and there's this whole interactive aspect of this on the website that you can reach through the, the website connected to this, I wanted to map this against all the averages for the entire country so we could see where these four that are, were most concerning lie. As you can see, while there might be pockets within other cities that are bad, they are worse than the worst performing major U.S. cities of any size. And when we talk about the equity budget, the equity lens, that's the new thing, this last budget passed based on an equity lens, the only other major American city that's tried that is Seattle. And Seattle is not exactly our sister city when it comes to this, because they're very, very different across so many metrics. And when it comes to education, for less than a ninth grade, I think they're about six from the bottom, meaning best in the country. And we're among the worst. So these are things that we need to start thinking about as a city, and not in silos. There's another map that you can reach that talks about how actually mapped against the rest of the country, the average for the US, at every single level, we are less educated in San Antonio. And then there's another map that's below that but was hard to include in this, which shows that we also under-earn at every single level. So once again, education connected to earnings, we're in a very bad situation if we don't address this. So by happenstance, I found out there was something in the 1970s that the Brookings Institution developed to look at US cities and compare them it left San Antonio out of the comparison, even though it looked at about 50 of them. But anyway, it's called a hardship index. And it basically is a mathematical formula that uses census data for six different metrics that it thinks are important, and you would agree if you knew what they were. And basically, it's possible to also apply that to neighborhoods or zip codes. So we were already getting the impression that these four zip codes we're talking about tonight have very serious challenges, and by running the hardship index against them, they are literally the top four in the city. So, this is what it's based on, and I'll put this out on the website so you can see it. It's pretty standard stuff that makes a lot of sense. And what this leaves us with is something called concentrated disadvantage. So while people in nonprofits generally tend to be very up on what services they deliver, the reality is in certain parts of the city, there are overlapping layers of disadvantage that make it really hard to rise up from under that. Now there are mitigating things too, and social workers think in terms of that, people's resilience. But we also have to be real, this is not distributed equally across San Antonio. And San Antonio really has no ideal match across the country. It's the seventh largest city in America, but it has very little in common with the other in the 10 largest cities, it has a different immigration pattern, all kinds of things are different. So for it to chart its path forward, it has to figure itself out and develop its own model. Because it can't just say we're just like LA, so let's imitate what LA does. The public health department here, Metropolitan Health Commission, really has a lock on a lot of this understanding. They know that the social determinants of health matter more than even the type of health care people are receiving. So growing up impoverished with additional layers of disadvantage 
just make your life tougher across so many, so many ways. And what you end up doing in the end is there's a 20 year life expectancy difference in San Antonio between the highest performing zip codes and the lowest performing. That's where you really see this come to life. This is the spread of median home values in San Antonio. You hear people sometimes say, why don't people just move out of these areas as if it were that doable? There's a thousand percent spread between the median, meaning just the average home value up in the north and in the center of the city. And the middle class often uses their home value as a way to bootstrap kids' education. Not possible when you're at the bottom of that heap. Now, another reason why this matters is because services that could help people survive and excel and succeed are also concentrated where there is less demand inexplicably and not where they're needed. So you've seen before where people aren't graduating from high school. This is the availability of licensed childcare in the city. Very much oversupplied in the north and undersupplied in the center, west, and east, and the south. Same thing when you look at special needs childcare, which is even more hard to find. So difference in life expectancy, 20 years, and income inequality then becomes a huge deal. San Antonio is one of the most economically segregated and residentially segregated cities in the nation. And here's a map of where single moms are leading households. This guy who studied it, Richard Florida, says it's actually getting worse, not better. And he took a look at Salt Lake City where people have more ability to rise above their origins and tried to figure out what makes it different. And he thought, well, one big deal is there's no wrong door. You go to any social service agency and they assess you for all your needs, not just one. No turf warfare. He seemed to think that that would be a big deal because they're not any more pro-government than any other part of the country was. Um, income mobility, people in San Antonio have very little chance of moving up very much a service economy. And then when you get into types of households, households led by single mothers across the country are always in the most difficult situation. Married families in the best. You can kind of look at, at this stuff at your leisure. Um, one thing people don't necessarily realize, there are almost as many poor whites in San Antonio as poor Hispanics. Part of what I learned through this whole project is there are no super simple answers like let's blame it on immigrants, or let's blame it on people not speaking English, or whatever, and you know how popular those are today. It's really important to be able to find out that that isn't the case. So um, this is kind of a cool slide. The guy who is the head of our College of Pol Public Policy, Dr. Rogelio Sainz, that is where Mexicans are moving in San Antonio, and it's not that Mexicans would mean because the net migration is going the opposite of how America thinks it's going. So it was just important to take a look at a lot of these things. We have terrible literacy rates. This is food insecurity, uh, family violence rates, juvenile probation. Over and over, we just keep seeing these same uh, these same patterns. And we just thought it was really important to a bring this information out there, and then assemble a really awesome panel of experts who all have a lived experience and a lot of wisdom and knowledge to talk about how we got here, we, where we are right now, which we can kind of tell from that so we can maybe skip that, and what the way forward looks like. So I wanted their panelists to take just a minute to introduce themselves and say who they are and why this topic interests them, because I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from them and their bios are on the website. Thank you. Hello, I'm Matt Martinez. I am a researcher at Rice University. I have uh, grown up, raised in San Antonio, um, got my PhD from UTSA. Uh, Dr. Sines was actually on my uh, research committee, dissertation committee. Uh, so I'm very familiar with his work as well. 
I have spent uh, years, uh, I spent a couple years working with communities and schools um, on the east side of San Antonio, uh, worked at John F. Kennedy High School as an AmeriCorps VISTA, so I'm familiar uh, enough with San Antonio. I research the city. Um, part of my research interest will uh, center on uh, looking at the historic uh, patterns of unequal education, educational attainment, and I look at this thing that I am uh, coining called dropout legacies, this idea of places, of neighborhoods that have had historically high dropout rates from 1970. Um, and the reason I look at 1970 is because that's where the data are available. I'm actually working with uh, Professor Brown uh, to push that back to 1930, 1940 in San Antonio. Um, and so with that, you know, my interests are, uh, what really spurred that project was when I was working at Kennedy, I would always hear, well, things have always been this way. Things have always been this way. I was like, okay, I don't know if that's true. Let me find out if it's true. And so I did this research project and found out that it is true. And, and so why? Right? And that's why, um, that's why I'm here, to help have that discussion. Why, why these neighborhoods, why these zip codes, um, and then how can we move forward from that? Good evening. My name is Keta Rodriguez. Um, I'm interested in this topic because I've lived it. Um, I'm born and raised here in San Antonio. I grew up, I grew up in 78207. Um, my family has been here for generations. And um, quite frankly, uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, in academia. Um, but I have the life experience. I, like I said, I grew up here. I was uh, born. I was born and raised in the area that is now known as Vista Verde. It's right all over the uh, overpass on Guadalupe, the Guadalupe Street Bridge. Um, that area was completely different at one time. Um, I remember walking those streets where there were no sidewalks. Uh, our neighbors across the street had no uh, pub, uh, indoor plumbing. And uh, it wasn't, if it wasn't for the community members that you know really fought for change in that neighborhood, it wouldn't be what it is today. And now it's a it's a nice little neighborhood with affordable homes. Um, in fact, I was telling Lily one day that there used to be a tree where the UTSA downtown campus parking lot was, and that tree was right in front of my house. And every time I drive the loop, I'd see that tree, and it always remind me of you know you know what that neighborhood was like, and what that community was like. Unfortunately, right on the other side of the bridge um, is where all my, was where all my friends lived. Uh, most of them lived in the Alasana Pache courts. I spent a lot of time there um, as a child. Um, I left here in 1991. And again, you know, having been born and raised at that time, I was already 21 years old. Having seen that uh, much of this area exactly the same, and when I saw the maps, you know, I said, you know, I've known this my entire life. But it's really quite striking to see it right in your face, the same maps over and over, the same types of data, the same zip codes coming up over and over and over. And 1991, I left. I went to, I joined the Marine Corps. I served for 20 years. And I returned um, about five years ago. And unfortunately, I see much of exactly the same. I tell this really quick story of five girls that went to JT Brackenridge Elementary School, Eleanor, Iris, Gina, Shirley, and me. All of us were in the Girl Scouts together. We did a lot of you know, field trips and stuff like that together. By the time we graduated, well, by the time I graduated from high school in 1988, only one of us had graduated. Three of them, three had become moms between middle school and 10th grade. One of them became a drug addict, and one of them is no longer with us. She was a victim of domestic violence. That's why this topic really interests me. It, quite frankly, I get really upset and pretty emotional when I think about it, that I come back and I see the exact same situation uh, being faced. We have made some progress, but a lot more needs to be done, and that's why I'm here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Diego Bernal. I'm the state representative for House District 123. Uh, I'm also a social worker, so I'm excited that the School of Social Work has put this together. I've always felt like social workers are really training to be advocates, and I'm, I'm happy to see that you're doing that um, same, from this area, same life experience, same story with my friends. Um, I'm at a point now where there's nothing about the maps or the story or the personal experiences that surprises me. I don't think anyone who's on the panel or in 
the audience is shocked by what we're hearing. We're sort of seeing it in detail, but it's not uh, a truth that we don't already know. I'm sort of at the point now where I'm more interested in solutions. And I also think that what happens to people who mean well, who are trying to fix something, is we start to fight among ourselves about what the solution is. And by doing that, we kind of get nowhere. Because we can't decide if it's transportation, if it's jobs, if it's education, if it's testing, if it's higher education, or pre-K. And I'm at the point where why don't we just start trying it all? Why don't we just get on with it and start trying to do things instead of sort of being in a holding pattern, waiting for that magic moment where something happens and we've figured it out? There's no easy answer. There's no right answer. But the one thing that we have continued to do is a, is a lot of nothing. And so I find it easy to critique efforts that maybe aren't perfect, but I give people credit for trying. So, for example, this is the first time we've used the equity lens in the city budget. We've never done it before. Let's give it a shot. Is it going to solve everything? No. But at the end of this budget cycle, will some things in some places be better than they were the year prior? Yeah, they will. So I think if we all just sort of lean in, push hard, and, and, and allow one another to try to fix these things, as opposed to holding each other back because we don't always agree with what the right solution is, we can get somewhere. You're never going to get perfection right away, but you will get progress. And, and, I'll, and right now, after all the things that we've seen and the things that you guys studied and the things that you've lived, and you certainly lived and you've lived, I'll take a little progress right now. So thanks for having me. Good evening. Um, my name is um, Patty Bradel, and I have been living in zip code 78207 for the past 48 years. Um, I have always lived within a block or two of the Aladon Apache Courts, the oldest housing project in the country, actually. Um, I, I moved into the community out of a commitment to simple living uh, I'm not a social worker. I am um, a neighbor who uh, has become very active in her neighborhood and active with other neighbors um, to address the issues that are in our community and work together to hopefully uh, make things better. Um, my husband is in the back. Uh, we're the, uh, volunteer directors of an agency called Inner City Development. We deal a lot with the emergency services that are needed for many families. Um, we deal with education and recreation uh, for children. And uh, we've done that the entire time um, we've uh, been living in the community. And again, we see ourselves as neighbors um, who are active. I've also served on the city council from uh, 03 to 07, and I'm presently serving on the SAISD school board uh, as president of the board. I was elected in 2011. And, um, and you know, what's my interest in, in being here tonight? Well, you know, it's, a, it's within the system of education. I'm in the system of education. I certainly want to support people being educated about uh, the situation, and I think I have something to offer for the decades that I've been in the community dealing with issues of poverty. Um, however, um, like Diego, I am very anxious to, to see more people doing a whole hell of a lot more. Uh, because we have been studied to death. And I mean that literally. We get studied and we get ideas proposed to, as to what should be done. And the money is never there. It never happens. But another, another study comes, another study comes. And like Diego said, let's, let's support this equity lens. It's important. And this year in the budget, it did make a difference. We just have to make a whole heck of a lot of difference. And more people need to take ownership of the responsibility. Okay, that magic moment, we are the magic moment. You know, is it going to come alive? So those kind of questions and those kind of issues that I've seen for decades, that's why I'm here tonight.
Good evening, everyone. How are you? Uh, my name is Richard Montes. I, uh, my background has primarily been in workforce and business development. I worked um, as the county's business service coordinator uh, at Workforce Solutions Alamo through an organization called SER, Jobs for Progress. Um, also did some time uh, at Google uh, recruiting software engineers throughout North America and helping prepare recent college grads for being successful in STEM, um, STEM roles uh, throughout North America for Google. Um, most recently, I'm also working as a director at the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, uh, doing legislative and advocacy work for Hispanic-serving institutions in North America and some uh, international institutions as well. I also serve as president of the board of directors at Inner City Development, where Patty is, uh, Patty and her husband are volunteer co-directors. Um, and I guess we have, so we have a few Westsiders on this panel, <laughs> Patty, Geta, Diego, um, and so, how many of you lived or have lived in, or, or currently live in the zip codes that we're going to be talking to tonight? All right, so many of you have experienced firsthand what some of the challenges are and probably can find a whole lot in common with some of the things that the folks up here are going to be saying. I think Patty's absolutely right that we're, we're in a stage right now in San Antonio that is extremely critical, right? So I think there's a small window of opportunity to really not, not just discuss the issues, that you and I have been noticing for a very long time, but to provide real world solutions. And I'm glad that we're gonna be discussing the past here in a little bit because it really contextualizes the conversation that we're gonna be having. But really live in the moment of the present and think about what each of us can do to address some of the issues that we're facing day in and day out as members of this community. Um, I myself have been very encouraged uh, by the conversations that we're seeing start up um, at the municipal level about equity. And a few months ago, I, I think it was Maria Berriozabal, um, those of you who are familiar with her, she was the first uh, Mexicana, Americana elected to the San Antonio City Council, um, started, she, she mentioned something and said that, that really stuck with me. She said, I'm glad that the city of San Antonio and our leaders are finally catching up with the conversation that those of us who have been living in this neighborhood have been having for a very long time. And so is the solution and the outcome going to be perfect? I don't know but it really does take your engagement and your voice to weed out all the bad ideas that we can possibly get that continue to marginalize people. And I know that we'll be talking a little bit again about the history and the racism and the marginalization and the segregation that really is rooted in our history that's brought us to where we are today. And, and that's why I'm interested in, in, in participating in this conversation. And I hope you will be too, because you bring an interesting and important perspective and experience that really is valuable to the conversation um, that we're going to be having here tonight. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. Representative Bernal, if you could get us up to speed a little bit on the history of education and litigation in San Antonio, if you need to call anyone or want to call anyone from the audience about that, mm -hmm. or if you just want to cover it. And then I want to move to Matthew Martin is on the end to talk about dropout legacy because this is a really shocking and cool concept to, to know about. I can, let me try to summarize it because there are college classes on this subject. One, uh, it was a Supreme Court case out of the city that we call Rodriguez. And in that case, the Supreme Court essentially says that getting an education isn't a right and that being poor is not a protected class. There's been a, a history of school finance cases in Texas, all coming from San Antonio, all led by the Edgewood School District. Uh, many of them were championed by an attorney named Al Kaufman. The latter decade, the last decade of that work, um, was championed by David Hinosa, who's in the audience today, uh, and who I trained under as a civil rights litigator. He's much better than I am. But in those cases, essentially, the, the argument is that the way that the state of Texas funds its public schools is inequitable, in that because it's based on property taxes, at a certain point, there are built-in inequities. In other words, children are paying for the, the areas that they're born into. And that creates a difference in funding. And because the state sets the standards that all kids have to meet, you've got to meet the kids where they're at. So some kids need more help than others. And if you're not providing with the resources to get there, they're not going to perform. There's a debate over, let's call it, 
giving every kid the same amount of money or giving every kid enough money to get to a certain point. Most recently, the last version of this lawsuit, the Supreme Court said, look, Texas, the way that you fund your public schools, it's a mess. You really should be ashamed of yourself. It's very hard to understand. You really should fix this, but we're not going to make you. And they walked away. So I could go on forever, but that's basically it. The, the way that Texas funds its public schools, one, is based on property taxes, and the amount of money per kid and achievement tracks poverty perfectly. There's no heartbeat, there's no ridge, there's no plateau, it is a straight line. And so, to some people who say that money doesn't matter, it does. Is it the only answer? No. Is it, in my opinion, the middle 60 or 70 percent of the answer? It is. And just to, just to close the point off, I think the basic ethos behind all of these lawsuits is this. Whether you're on the west side or you're in Alamo Heights, those kids aren't any smarter, they're not more curious, they're not more capable than anywhere else. It's just our job to make sure that we unpack Travel and promote all of that talent. And right now, there are obstacles in the way from allowing them to do that. Because remember, they all have to compete with one another at a certain point. And so, I believe that the public school system in Texas is the last, or one of the last vestiges of civil rights litigation and experience that you can see with your own eyes, and we've done nothing about. You go to one side of town, you see a school looks one way. You go to another side of town, you see a school looks another way. You look inside that school, you teachers, resources, and technology that pales in comparison. Now people are trying to they're trying to fix that and they're doing what they can with what they've got. But the, the genesis, the, the purpose of those lawsuits is, is to try to right that wrong. And the answer to the question is it has not happened yet. Talk to Dave afterwards, he'll he can do a, sem a seminar on this, but that's that's the short version. And Dr. Martinez, would you like to talk about what you learned in the process of figuring out about dropout legacy? For sure. Uh, like I touched on a little bit ago, it's this idea of neighborhoods, and I did it throughout the country, that have, uh, we're in the top quartile, so they're in the top uh, distribution of dropout rates. They have the highest dropout rates in 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010. So uh, essentially what I'm deeming as a legacy Right, like there's this legacy that has been there, um, and one I do a study looking at San Antonio, and of course, like it would map perfectly with your maps, right? Like we, you know, I could go up there and give the same presentation, and you would think you'd be looking at the same map. It's the same thing. The dropout legacy neighborhoods are the ones that you already saw. Um, but what the other thing that I do is I tie uh, individual students who live in these neighborhoods and find that if a student lives in these neighborhoods, regardless of the parent's income, education, uh, regardless of if it's a private school, a public school, charter school, whatever, um, that that student will have a 15% greater likelihood of dropping out themselves, right? And so what does this say? This says to me um, that it, I, I think oftentimes in education, and I study education uh, as a profession, that the, the solutions are always looked at, well, teachers, or well, principals, well, the school. I'm looking at the neighborhood, right? And why does that matter? It, it's, it's about uh, the history of divestment in this country, and especially in Texas, right, that has existed in these neighborhoods. That's the story, right? And then, then we start to look at, well, why? Okay, well, a lot of people go back to, uh, when you talk about legacy, they'll go back to redlining. Well, I want to push that story further back. What I find is that the the, Neighborhood racial compositions in San Antonio in 1930 and 1940 are the same that they are today, right? So this is a, a longer history. And then um, I have another study where I'm looking at segregation in 1880 in the U.S. and, and finding that segregation is a direct tie to slavery, right? And so we can go all the way back as far as we want but what we're going to find is that segregation, racial segregation, economic segregation are patterned and they are reified. They, are, um, became, they become more solid through policy, right? And so at the end of the day, when we're talking about uh, dropout legacy neighborhoods, we're, we're talking about, well, there's only so far that a school can get to, right? And, and until 
um, there's only so much that the school is responsible for in educating the child, right? There's also um, how neighborhoods are treated, how they're not funded, how businesses aren't, uh, you know, drawn to them, or they're not, you know, given incentive to go, right? Like, and, and we can, uh, I can talk about all these, you know, different studies that have done this, but I think, um, as, as some of the panel have already said, that the, when I think about legacy, and I think about, well, you have to have policies that will not only bring up that neighborhood, but help them excel, right? So there might need to be inequality in funding, but that inequality needs to go the other way, right? Because these neighborhoods have had this history of inequality and, and this history of divestment, that they're gonna need a lot more to be brought up. And then, then you can talk about equalizing, right? Like then you can get to the point when they're both, but if I send somebody out and say, all right, you can go ahead and start the race, and you just hold back. All right, but now you guys, you know, we're gonna go at the same pace after we, you already had the advantage. That's not, you're never gonna catch up, right? And so, um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'll leave it. So, to go into that a little bit further, how are you seeing that with individual students as you track them over time, and also the racial disparities? Because it seems like when you read about education, the ninth grade year is super, super critical, but minority students have a tougher time with it across the country, which doesn't necessarily mean throw more money at it so much as be smarter about what's going on. What have you been fi finding the lived experiences for dropout legacy? Yeah, and that's the, I think that's the piece that's missing, right? Like the qualitative piece, right? Like I haven't interviewed individual students. Um, I look at it more from an aggregate. And so, I mean, but to touch on the racial component, right, like, the, the racial component exists only because of poverty, right, because uh, certain racial groups have been segregated, and then the divestment occurs in those neighborhoods, right? So when you start to see, well, Hispanics have a lower dropout or higher dropout rate and they have a higher poverty rate, it's not about being Hispanic. There's nothing in your genetic makeup that makes you more prone to poverty, no, it's the policies in which usually white legislation, right, push through. And I, and I think, like, part of this conversation is a racial conversation as well, right? And that's the point of why I brought it back to slavery, right? Because in this country, that's our original sin for a lot of ways. And, and so now we can see how it plays out today. I'm happy to have other people jump in and talk about what they see that relates. We're talking about how we got here. Uh, well, I think I'm just immediately reacting to the ninth grade uh, dropout thing. I mean, I, I think as far as stories are concerned, I've witnessed a lot of stories where it seems to be an age where many um, the high schools in our community, uh, 7207, that they get to an age where they, they witness the poverty of their own family and they, they think that they can get a job. And then they drop out and they try that and they find out how difficult it is to do anything substantial to make a difference in the household. And then by the time they've tried that long enough, it's embarrassing to go back or it's difficult to go back. Um, and I think that there's an element within that that may be missed in some of the statistics given here. And that's the cultural one. Uh, the, the, the sense of um, responsibility to help the family that I think, I don't, I don't want to make a, a, a judgment, but I sense it as very strong, I should say, within the Hispanic culture, that sense of responsibility to help out your family. And, um, and I think that's a big piece of what happens as, um, you know, the children get older and see the suffering in the family and the challenges and the house falling down and not having enough food that motivates them to do something. And if I could, real quick, I think there's a, there's a part of the question that I want to take a little issue with. And that is that there's this notion that if you throw money at the problem, it doesn't work. And I don't know if we can point to an example where we've tried that and decided that it didn't work out. I don't know if we can point, oh, we overfunded education, that didn't work out. But we, <laughs> we, we haven't really done it yet. Yes, we need to be more strategic. But I also think that, that that's, a, that's, a, that's an easy thing to say but it's not like we have a lot of we have a lot of data to show that it doesn't work. Now, 
in this city, they like to do per pupil funding and compare districts, but they're spending the money on different things. So in Alamo Heights, for example, they're not spending the same amount of money on food and transportation as they are in SEISD. So if you if you control for that, then the data shows that money does matter. It's not everything, but to say it doesn't matter, I think is, is dangerous, and, and I'll tell you why. The state of Texas has divested, it has reduced funding in education by about 30% over the past 10 years. If money doesn't matter, then we would be able to say safely that that didn't hurt. And it has absolutely hurt. It has been devastating for us. So I just want to, I, I don't want to move away too far from the school finance part of the conversation. It is not everything, but it is a very big something. <laughs> I, I want to throw in some, some personal experience because I, I think that's kind of what I bring to the table. Speaking from a, um, a household with two parents who were high school dropouts, my mom uh, went to, up to the eighth grade at Rhodes Middle School just down the street, and my dad um, stopped going to school when he was about 10th grade uh, because I was born. And there's a certain degree of uh, pull that um, a child gets on their dignity Right, seeing their parents working so very hard every day, spending little time with them um, to help build the love that's necessary in a home, but also help them with their own educational needs. And it becomes very discouraging as a child to see um, that vicious cycle playing out, right? When even their parents before theirs, uh, my grandmother went up to just, you know, elementary school. And so um, what we, I think what we need to do is start to really embrace um, these kids who are even just first generation high school students and high school graduates and start to really help them understand the value that they bring and help them recoup some of the dignity that, that seems to be lost when you're living in those vicious cycles of poverty. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to say, because education I think sometimes in itself gets siloed a lot um, and we, we tend to talk about education with respect to you know, pre-K through 12 and then at the college level. But in our communities, I think it's also really important to talk about job training education because we have had such a history of dropout um, high rates in our community. If all we're focusing on is school districts, which is important, I'm not going to be the person up here who doesn't want to talk about school districts. Um, if all we're focusing on school districts and college graduation and not focusing on, on re-engaging and re-educating those folks who have dropped out of the system, then all we are doing is perpetuating a cycle for the next 30 years, right, of people who didn't finish high school. And so I think it's important to really start to reinvest back into our job training programs. Um, there is a rising need, for example, for blue collar STEM workers that people don't know about. You know, your electricians, your cable pullers, folks like that that are going to be able to um, get a benefit from not only the growing construction in San Antonio, right, all the development that we're seeing, but the growing tech scene as well. Um, and so if, if, if we're going to really focus on not just casting a net that, that cares for children currently in the system, we also need to focus on casting a net that, that re-engages those, those folks that have not been, that we have failed. Because it is our system ultimately that has failed these folks. Um, I, I, have, I I have heard over and over and over and again the stigma that perpetuates our communities when people say, the people who live in, in the barrio, they're lazy. They don't want it bad enough. They don't work hard enough. They, they, they have, um, they, 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 they've learned these behaviors. And I, I don't think that that's necessarily true, right? There's nobody in this community that you will find if you ask them, do you want to be poor, will say yes. I love being poor. It's so great. I spend, it, it takes so much, it takes so much time to be poor, guys. It's hard work to be poor, believe it or not. Um, and so I, I think if, if, when we're talking about not just, you know, preaching to the choir, because there's so many of you here who live in these zip codes, but offering real solutions, right, and a trajectory toward achieving those things. So I hope that when we're talking about equity, that we keep in mind that job training and jobs and employment are necessary so that we can help uplift these folks' dignity and get them to become productive members of society because they can make contributions 
but they need those of us who have managed to break some of those cycles to help pull them um, to, to help pull them into really understanding what it's like to be a contributing member of the society. I just kind of want to put a um, just to give you kind of a sense of the of the magnitude of the problem. You know, and I, again, without uh, saying how old I am, I did graduate in 1988. And my freshman class started at almost 1,000 students. We were one of the largest um, classes, uh, incoming freshman classes at Lanier High School. We graduated at three, less than 350 students. Obviously, a lot of dropouts, lots of teen pregnancy, you know, a lot of them due to teen pregnancy, a lot of them due to cultural issues, a lot of them due to the, you know, the kind of the, um, you know, people that move around a lot because there's housing instability. There's all kinds of issues that contribute to that. But that was, when I think about that, that is just, you know, it's right in your face. And I, I think that to kind of go back to the point that Matt was making a little while ago, it, of course it's education. Of course we know that if you, you, know, if you don't get a quality education, your chances of being successful um, and getting yourself out of poverty are severely diminished. But what is it? You know, before you get to that educational piece, it all comes back, and this again, my personal opinion, I haven't done any studies on it, but it all comes back to poverty. And it comes back to the environment. You know, the, the, the girls that I talked about earlier, none of them had like really bad parents. You know, they all had parents that had dreams and hopes for them, just like all of us as parents do, right? That your kids will do better than you did. Um, but the neighborhoods, the lack of infrastructure, the kind of the things that, and there is a little bit of that kind of, this is the norm, right? All, all four of those girls that all had their, that had their babies before they could finish high school were all children of teenage moms. And those moms were children of teenage moms. So their grandmothers, same thing. And many of them growing up kind of in the exact same environment. So that we have those cycles continuing over and over and over. And again, you know, we have made some, some strides there. I think here in Texas, I was just listening to NPR on the way over here, and we our uh, teen pregnancy rate has dropped significantly, but we're still extremely high as compared to the rest of the nation. But we go back to the environment, and we go back to poverty. Before we can even address, you know, the housing and the education and all of those things, we have to look at it from multiple levels. It's not just... You know, again, throwing money at the problem of education. Trust me, I'm not one to think to say that you know that doesn't work. Absolutely, we need more funding. Um, but it takes people at all levels, from the community, from our elected officials, across different levels levels of government. You know, across the community, across the city, and you know, the equity lens. I'm really, really happy to hear the the mayor talking about this. And I, I really think that a better term for that would have been needs based. Right, because equity, when we talk about equity, to some people in, in the not on my map areas, what do they think? And not everybody, I'm not gonna stereotype, but some people it's like it doesn't impact me, right? It does not impact me, so why should I be concerned about what's happening in 78207? Well, guess what it is impacting you? It's impacting all of us. Why do you think that we have such a hard job with our workforce development? Because we have an uneducated population. You know, why do we have a drain on our taxpayer dollars for social services that we could have prevented way back when? We have a high, one of the highest rates of diabetes and health care, you know, health conditions. Why, you know, we're spending tons of money on, on diabetes clinics and dialysis centers and all of these things, right? Everything is tied together, but it all goes back to poverty. And it all goes back to our investment in our neighborhoods and getting our ch youngest children to see that there is something else beyond that. And that, that, quite frankly, that we all care, that the city cares, that the state cares, that we all, that we actually care about what happens to them. And you know, people that think that it doesn't impact them, severely mistaken. You know, so um, those were just my two cents on that. Thank you. I think that brings up a really good point because as Richard was saying, there's a joke out there about the trouble with being poor is it takes up all your time. And that's actually really true. The part of the complexity issue of the, all this overlap is how easy is it to get a job that will create income for your family when you live in a place that doesn't have any kind of transportation and it's a service economy and you're having to work two and three jobs 
I mean, if you're a parent in that situation, you can't be home helping your kids with their schoolwork. You don't even have any energy after running all around town to get to your job or jobs to earn the money. So I think part of what's frustrating about this is feeling like, A, people don't stop to think of how time consuming it is to be poor and what the impacts on your life really are. It's not easy to fix with just one thing. You sometimes have to pick the thing that could make, mean, make the most difference or you have to work on multiple things at once. And not everyone can do that, especially without help. And then as a, as a city, are we really acknowledging that? If we are based on a service industry model and somewhat low wage jobs and lack of health insurance, what really is the future going to be like unless we switch that up a little bit, create some opportunities for people who don't necessarily want to go to college and do a better job of educating people that education is a crucial way to improve not only your economic performance, but that of your families as well. And I think when it comes to social services, I'm not sure that over time enough thought has really gone into how this all works together beyond just individual agencies and how to really make economic arguments about it in order to be heard. It was shocking to me to see how much we not only are undereducated, but under earned at every level. And that one data visualization has had thousands and thousands of views because I think people see that and they go, right. This is a way to explain that. I think we've all got to, especially on the social service delivery side, got to get better at being able to explain how much it costs to leave the situation the way it is and how much of a difference it could make if we change things. So in terms of that, what are some things you feel excited about that you see going on right now? Uh, one of the problems that we have with being so unique as a city is that we don't have an easy model, an easy analog anywhere. And when you talk to urban planning types, they sometimes say the coolest municipalities out there have moved away from silos because they realize that it is everyone's problem to improve the playing field. So what kinds of work are you doing or seeing that you're excited about? Because if we stay the same, we know what the future is going to look like. It will pass us by. Ah, a silo like on a farm where they keep oh, the, I know that. the you're grains. Using, you're, you're using this word silo. Right, because people who do one type of work don't communicate outside that. They, they talk to each other about what it's like with whatever their topic is. And eventually, everyone pushes their own agenda, but they don't see it as a shared agenda. So transportation people are in the transportation silo. The housing people, I went to a housing meeting and they basically said every good thing in the world comes through housing. And it's like, well, a lot of good things too, but not all of them. You can be too stuck on a single agenda. That's what it means. Um, you, you ask um, what we're excited about. And I, I have to say, I'm not excited about anything in a positive manner. I'm excited, nervous. Um, because of uh, what could happen for lack of sensitivity. Those of you who uh, grew up and live, live on the west side, would you raise your hands again? Could you leave your hand up if you are interested in moving into a big house outside out at 1604? Okay. Well, I, I, felt, I felt secure in asking that question because for um, knowing our neighbors, I mean, yes, we have... Um, all the, the ills of poverty. And uh, sometimes I tease and say, yes, we are a social worker's paradise, um, which is a terrible thing to think of, but we have all those things of poverty. But at the same time, we love our neighborhood. We do. And when a house becomes available, you know, people are anxious for it, but housing is a really, really big problem in our community. So we have to think about what is it that we love that we don't want to see disappear? Are we going to feel the same about our neighborhood if somebody decides in one of these many committees that are happening about developing in our city, 
Oh, you don't have enough high rises over there, you know? Are we happy with that? You know, there's depravity on the north side. When I say those poor people out there, they can't walk to their neighborhood taco place. They don't have a neighborhood taco place. They can't walk to their church. They can't walk to their school, usually. I mean, many can, depending on the location of the school. But in my neighborhood, I can walk to the church. I can walk to the elementary, middle school, high school. I can walk to multiple taco houses. I can walk to the plaza. There are beautiful things about our neighborhood that we have to ask ourselves, oh, what are we willing to preserve? Because when we talk about leveling the playing field, the field doesn't look the same all over the city. And I don't know if people want it to look the same all over the city. So what is pressure to us? And what is precious to us? And what are we going to fight to maintain? You know, when somebody says that they want, you know, a 20 story building on the corner of Zazamora and Guadalupe. Is that going to be us? Is that going to, is that going to feel like who we are, the, all the cultural history? What are we going to protect? That's what I'm nervous. I'm not excited. What does density bring? What does density usually bring with it? What does density bring? Yeah. Well, I think um, you have to ask um, what is density without dignity? Because when you take a look around Loop 410, there's lots of density, all those apartments. But they have the dignity of good streets. They've got curbs. They've got drainage. But, you know, go down Elvira Street. Go down Torreon. No drainage. And the houses are falling apart. Yes, I've been at those meetings and in a little committee, the, you know, they were asking us about the maps and we were fighting for nothing over three stories. And there was pushback from the people who were the planners saying, how oh, five feet, there's other things, I mean, five stories, there's more you can do. So the question again, what will we protect? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that one of the re one of the really important things that you're seeing here and that you see here is that all these issues are interconnected, right? And my experience has been that we start to fight over where we should be spending our time and our attention. Is it housing? Is it gentrification, which is a lot of what you're talking about? Is it education? Is it workforce? Is it transportation? And the answer is all of the above, right? The answer is all of the above. If we all, if we all just put all of our energy into one thing, we'll still lose because we're not minding all those other issues. And so what I would say to people is to figure out where you think you would be most effective and apply yourself there and then hope that and assure that other people who feel like they're more effective in other places are doing their part. But when I was younger, I'm 41, when I was younger, all of the the activists were too busy criticizing each other for being too corporate or too street or we should be we should be protesting, we should be running for office. And the truth is it takes all sorts, it takes all kinds. You can't succeed without the other. Right? You need the people in office, you need the people on the streets, you need the academics pulling you further to make sure you're not missing anything. You need all of it. You need the state, you need the city, you need the county, you need all of it. So let's not waste our time criticizing each other, wagging our finger at one another about where we should best apply ourselves and make sure that people find the place where they can best apply their talents and just push as hard as they can. I think that one of the assets that we have not used in this city, that we're actually using today, is our school of social work. These are people whose job it is to be professional advocates. In the past, when you meet someone who can argue, you say, oh, you think you'd be a good lawyer. And you meet someone who likes to help people or heal people and say, oh, you might be a doctor. When you meet someone who's nice, 
you think, I might be a good social worker. <laughs> That's not right. A social worker, by definition, is a fierce advocate for other folks. And so the school of social work, I think, now, this school and others in the city, are, are, are seizing the moment and recognizing that they have a place in this community to lead. And so that, that one thing I am excited about, there's a lot to be depressed about, one thing, one thing I am excited about is tonight, because I think that we see, we see an institution stepping into the fray and deciding to own its place in that conversation. So I, I do really appreciate that kind of stuff. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head as far as social work because in our school, we have almost 1,800 students and one social worker. You have, because I have sat on the other side of the table in Edgewood, I work in SAISD, I get to see what's happening on a daily basis with our students. I also get to see the denial from administration, and I'm talking administration overall. I'm not targeting one person. If you ask them, what is the job of a social worker, or what is a social worker? These are educated people, and they cannot tell you. When you have social workers doing hall duty, doing lunch duty, and then a crisis happens, oh, you can't leave your post. That's not right. We have a lot of students that come to our school with many problems before they even arrive in the classroom. And we expect them to learn, really? Have you walked in their shoes? No. We have wonderful, we have had wonderful social workers, both in Edgewood and in SAISD. But I went into office at one point for the simple reason that after having served 10 years, I went back in 2008, from 1986, and I went back, got off in 98, went back in 2008. Why? Because the administrator at that point wanted to get rid of the social worker position. And no negativity towards CIS. They wanted to bring in that program. In Edgewood, you work there. You know what our students are like. They're wonderful, but nobody really listens to them. We have talked about this issue forever and ever and ever. And still, in 2017, we have one social worker with over a 1,000 students. How can that be? Are we really interested in the children? No, we're not. Where do we start? We start there. That's when we get Because our kids come in with multiple, multiple problems that probably some of you didn't have to face in your childhood. And you said your age is 41, mine is 75. So I have seen a lot. I had a wonderful childhood with poor parents. But you, the dignity is always hurt. You go and ask one of our students what they want to be, they can't tell you because it's hopelessness. They're very well educated. We have smart students. Richard has been one of them. They can succeed, but you have to build them up. Who am I worried about? I'm worried about the C student that nobody notices. Everybody wants a high achiever, or they help the lower ones, because we're helping our neighborhood. Really? No, you're not. Look at all the issues. Thank you. One of the things that I think that, um, you know, we can be excited about, obviously, is what we were just talking about is, you know, looking at this, this from, a, from an equity lens. And one is having the conversation. I mean, for decades, that map has been exactly the same. And some people were talking about it, some people within the zip codes. You know, we have a lot of really great nonprofits that are doing some phenomenal work, working with, with students, working with families. And we've had a lot of these nonprofits around for a while, you know, providing the service. But the service is really reactionary. It's not preventative. We need to have the conversation. You know, I was, I was talking to someone recently about this you know, same topic, and I'm like, when you go into a business 
and that business is not producing, right? They're not having a profit. What do they do? They go back and look at the root cause of the problem. Why are, you know, why are we not having this profit? They devote a lot of time, they invest a lot of time, and really focus on attacking the root of cause of the problem, and then move along, adjust as they go, to become a successful company. It's the same thing. If we're not talking about this, you know, having this conversation, if we're not bringing this, you know, map into front of people who have the, the ability to create policy, to advocate, because quite frankly, we should all be advocates. Every single one of us, if we live in this community, we should be advocating in one, one, you know, shape, form, or fashion. And you know, and uh, Representative uh, Bernal is right. You know, find that area where you, that you're the strongest at. But we also have to we also have to force that conversation to happen in order for us to actually come in and and really concentrate on the root causes of these problems and stop being reactionary. You know, we've seen it here in our city. You know, the the reactionary. Um, approach to things, right? Well, we have a high, uh, high teenage pregnancy rate, then we start, you know, we throw money at that, which, yeah, of course, you have to address the, the, when the problem's already presented itself, but how about preventing it? Root, 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 the, uh, the causes of, of diabetes, again, a really huge uh, epidemic. Oh, well, let's build these clinics, and let's throw money at, the, at treatment, not prevention, you know? And so, Again, it's, I think, really going back to the whole point of this and having, not working in silos, that's across nonprofits. It's definitely, in my opinion, something that needs to be forced upon our government officials, the city, the county, the state, and our, and our congressional representatives that represent these areas should all be working together to try to find solutions to these problems. So if you have some questions, it's probably good to come up here because otherwise no one can hear you. But I think we will take a few questions and then we will move on to what the future is going to look like. So if you want to come up here and speak, ask your question, we can just try to keep them fairly short and succinct because there are a lot of people trying to be able to ask things of the panel. Well, good evening. Thank you for doing this. From here, the West Side, born and raised, uh, Kennedy alumni. Um, I'm with Head Start, and I just came back from a meeting or monthly meetings. I'm part of the Policy Council, and we we've had Head Start what for 54 years now. Um, San Antonio over 20, but now we have early Head Start, and it's been around for three years, and. When you talk about preventative, I think that's the root. And we're talking about the children, of course, they're number one, but also their families. And uh, August, the wait list was over 200, and as of October, it's over 400. And these are families that qualify, that are in need um, of help. And Head Start provides all these systems. I mean, connections, health. Um, I myself, uh, I was a parent of Head Start, you know, my twin daughters, I was a stay-at-home mom, I mean, I did get my degree, but I, I chose to be a stay-at-home mom, and then I volunteered, and then I became an employee, um, Head Start gave me a Head Start in getting my master's degree, so I have my master's degree in early childhood, so, beautiful program, and uh, we got awarded today. I was a parent, but there's a lot of parents. So it brings hope. And early Head Start, I feel, is the way. And the thing is, the lack of funding. And um, I feel bad for these families. And these are our families here that are just waiting for the opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to make the statement of I feel that could be a solution for a lot of our problems. For our family. Um, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment so people can ask questions as well. But um, since we're on the topic of kids, Ms. Morales, um, I think that you bring up a very, very important um, point, right? 
and that is that more often than not when we're having conversations in our city and, and in the nation and even throughout the world, um, we, we have this conversation about stakeholders, right? Who are the people who should be at the table making decisions? And so I know that everybody here is wondering, okay, well, you guys up here telling us what we already know and offering some solutions every now and then. But what can I do to take with me so that I can continue to be, so that I can help being a, be an equity builder in this community? And I think that one of the first things that you can do is change your mindset, and we should change our, the culture of the conversations we have about who stakeholders are. Because we talk about homeowners, we talk about renters, we talk about business owners, but we never mention kids. And they are the, the greatest stakeholder in our community because they've, li they've yet to live much of their lives. And so they have everything at stake. Their futures are at stake. And so, you know, I'm not saying you, know, you need a, a five-year-old at a, a, a task force meeting on housing that's gonna give you, you know, some perspective, but really think of a, of a systematic way of taking a child's perspective and implementing that in the policies that we see in our city and build the equity there, right? Um, I think that you're right, that Head Start has been a crucial tool in helping break some of those cycles um, in San Antonio. And, and I also want to say that I think that Pre-K 4SA has been a major component of some of the changes that we've started to see already in our city about building equity, a, a solution where we have said, what can we do fundamentally to change the trajectory of our youth in this city. And as a parent of a student at Pre-K 4SA, I can tell you that the school is exemplary, that the children are learning a different dynamic of education and in different ways. And I think for four years straight now, they have surpassed all the expectations even nationally that have been put set forward uh, for early childhood education. So it's, it's those kinds of things, it's that policy making that really is important and bringing those into a real tangible thing that, that can change people's lives, right? Because that's what we're talking about here tonight is how do we move the mark in people's lives? Um, the equity lens in our budget is important. Sure, it puts in more sidewalks and more streets and, and does some of those develop, development things of the neighborhood. But what can we do to change people's lives? And it starts with our kids. Without siloing the entire conversation, and by the way, thank you for asking that question because I'm sure other people were wondering as well. It, you, 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 you have to start there because it is a foundation, right? It's a strong foundation. You don't build a house on dirt, right? And, and, and you need a strong foundation to be able for that, that building, that, that component to last for generations. So thank you for bringing up kids. Ms. Morales, we don't do it enough. And thank you for bringing up the early childhood education component as well.
I think, I think it's safe to say that there's not one good answer to that question. If there was a silver bullet answer, then I would just say it and we'd know what to do. So from my, from my position right now, from this perch, the question I would ask is, if you noticed a lot of the things that, that you mentioned ended with and then the funding was cut, right? And so my question is, has there been any accountability for the cutting of those funds? And I would argue that the answer is no. I'd argue that there are human beings at the end of those decisions making them with zero repercussions for them, zero recourse. So there are lots of answers to your question. Uh, some of them are, are better answered by the other people here, but for me at least, I would say we have to hold the people who are responsible for those cuts accountable. And I'm not saying it has to be politics. I'm not saying keep electing me or anyone else. But my point is that What's happening is that people are making decisions for this community without any input, without any accountability, with no mercy. And we're also in a world now where, when I was growing up, kids were off limits. We talked about this the other day. And we're in a world now where kids' suffering is totally on the menu, and they're fine with it. We've done nothing to hold them accountable. So, again, there's lots of answers, but I think at a minimum, we need to trace those decisions back to the human beings that made them and hold them accountable. One is to expose them, make sure the people who are suffering the consequences understand that they made the decision, and then hold them accountable. Um, there's nothing that motivates a good decision like fear. And as soon as you make someone afraid, they act. I think one of the other things that we can do, so in my day job, I currently serve as the, the county veteran service officer. So I help veterans and their dependents access their benefits. Um, we find that in my line of work, there are never enough resources to meet the demand. But one of the things that, through that experience, I've learned is that we, going back to not working in silos, what I call stovepipes, not being stovepipes. We have lots of different agencies. We have different um, agencies and, you know, both government and nonprofit that, that do somewhat similar work. One of the things that I found most helpful to address the issues that we were having with meeting the demand was to breaking down the walls between us and some of the other veteran service organizations, between us and the state agency and the federal government. What if we all work together and we stretch those dollars that we have? And what if we all work together leverage each other's resources. Some of us may be, and I'll give you as just an example, our office helps every single veteran from the one that's transitioning off of active duty today all the way to the World War II veteran that's at the end of life. Well, we have an organization called Wounded Warrior Project. Their specialty is post 9-11 veterans, those that served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, if we have people who are living in an area, say, out by 1604 in Bitters, and they're a post 9-11 veteran. In the past, what has happened is, well, these are my clients, these are my clients, and everybody's holding on to their clients because we have our numbers to meet and such. My, my, thought of that, my thought is, well, why don't we put the client in mind? Why don't we keep the client in mind? If that person lives in that area and they're, they're of that era and this is that organization's specialty, doesn't it make more sense to refer them there? Say, hey, there's something closer to you, it's more accessible to you, and oh, by the way, it helps us to be able to do our job better because we're the only government agency that does home visits for people who can't come to us. So if we all work together, breaking down those walls of, you know, uh, you know, and not working in, in stovepipes, both again, government agencies, nonprofits, community organizations, uh, faith-based organizations, if we all work together a little bit more closely, we can make our, our dollars go much further. I guess just to throw this into the mix, again, it comes back to each of us asking um, what we can do. It's sort of like 
if someone's uh, bleeding and you don't have gauze pads, what do you do? You know, you, you, you grab a towel, you, you grab a shirt, you whatever you need to do to stop the bleeding. Um, and are we all asking ourselves, you know, what can we do to stop the bleeding of some of the crises that we, that we face? And um, I, I think holding elected officials accountable um, is very, very important. Um, I think raising the consciousness of what they did or they didn't do is very important. I think presenting to them the issues so they see the grave consequences of their decisions is very important. But I also think that being creative as a community and looking together to say, well, how can we solve this problem even if it's only in our little corner? You know, we haven't found a, uh, a way to engage enough parents, for instance, in our schools. We've expanded um, the uh, family and parent uh, uh, engagement programs. We're real glad for that, and Tina's being effective over at Lanier. But there's so much that our parents who are not working um, could be doing in our schools. But we, we as a system have to help create the opportunities, you know, um, for taking care of some of these issues. And we've had, even at our community center, some of our volunteers saying, well, we need to have a, you know, a, a child care program as part of what we do. And we're all volunteers, right? So I have to say to them, okay, who's going to volunteer to do this? You know, We need more regular daycare centers in our community, right? But for lack of them, well, what can we do? What can we do as a community? So I'm just throwing that into the mix of all things that need to be considered as we face challenges. We're going to take a couple more questions, but I just wanted to interject that I think part of what's going on here is we need to make this everybody's problem, not just the problem that when you live it, you understand it acutely, but everyone else gets to afford to ignore it. We need to have this conversation in a much more focused and widespread and advocacy-oriented way so that people can't afford to ignore the reality of their neighbors. And sadly, we're in the most difficult time politically in recent history. This is so much about getting your own and keeping your own and the hell with everybody else. But what we're talking about here needs broad-based solutions and even those who are at ease in the crescent of comfort caring about this on a humanitarian level so that everyone can succeed in the city. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Jennifer Lopez Garza, and I'm a community health worker with a program called Healthy Neighborhoods through San Antonio Metro Health. And um, I just wanted to ask the panel, um, one of the things that I see a lot, uh, I guess I should start with this. My program is a little bit different as a, as a community health worker. I'm not like a generic health worker, but more so a community organizer in the sense that uh, we work with community assets. So our whole goal is to work uh, on asset-based community development that we can grow the community from the bottom up instead of the top down. And one of the main things that I see a lot uh, going to the SA Tomorrow planning meetings uh, that's voiced from the community members is, is gentrification. It's something that keeps coming up. And so I'm wondering um, if y'all feel like this data will assist us as the people living here, or will it do us harm in the sense that once we start fixing some of these areas within our schools, within our uh, our environmental safety, our food sovereignty, et cetera, will that just bring a different class in? Could you elaborate a little more? Elaborate? Is that what you asked? Okay. So this data is, is pretty much pointing out a lot of, of uh, what we know already, living, like for a lot of us that live in the city or have worked within the city. And so we have this data, we, I think that we worked on this data, so hopefully we can do something about it. And so what I'm saying is, if we do something about it, about it, will it end up biting us? You know, will it end up coming back to haunt us in the sense that community members will say, oh, now things are great. And so since things are, are going good, we're going to raise the price of, uh, of housing. We're going to um, push the people who are currently living in our neighborhoods out. Yeah. 
your your question just um, again for me reinforces the my question about you know what do you want what do what do you want to maintain what do you want to keep what's important to us um, and um, and and what can we do to protect that and uh, you know if if we we fear certain things happening in the community we just have to be very very vocal and very demonstrative about that. At the same time, I think we have to ask ourselves in the context of what is it that we want. For instance, um, do we really want to keep that uh, ugly building because it's been here for 75 years? Or is it that we just don't want you to bring the Starbucks in or we don't want you to bring it? Or, <laughs> yes, yes, right. So, you know, so some people are going to um, differ on that, like, ooh, Starbucks, and other people don't know. You know, and uh, so you know, so it it's um, you know it makes for important community conversation. And um, so, what is it? Do you want to actually maintain that building, or do you want to maintain and bring back a vitality to the community? Um, you know, where's where's the emphasis? And and in the and in the place of what's important to us as a community, what are the possibilities? You know, so. What is it that we really want to preserve when we worry about gentrification? Yeah, and you know, to, to add to that, I feel like I do feel like gentrification has this very negative connotation behind it. Um, but gentrification is development without justice, right? And so, how do you have development with justice? I think that's kind of what you're talking about. And because um, for me, I, I think about you know, there, there's going to be a lot of personal mechanisms, right? Um, so say their development is starting to happen in the west side and somebody comes up to a family and says We're going to give you double what you paid for that house Are they going to sell and, and who who am I to say don't? Right, I, and that's a tricky conversation um, Because I'm like no no don't don't sell because we want to keep the neighborhood It's like well, I have a chance to do well for my family I'm not who am I to stop them right and so in, in that regard we have to be mindful of that, right? And so, um, and we also have to be mindful about things like rent control. We have to be, right, like, because you think about cities, like, so I study a little bit of the gentrification aspect of it. And so what's happening in the U.S. is we're not getting gentrified neighborhoods anymore. We're getting gentrified cities, right? San Francisco, you got to have 100,000 to live there. New York, Austin, right? Boston, Seattle. Right, you can start thinking about cities as these gentrified areas, and because it's gentrification run amok, right, development run amok. But um, Oakland was actually doing something very interesting. Uh, some churches bought out lands before gentrification happened, and then rented out to those families at cost of what they would to maintain taxes or whatever. Right, so like it takes very high, it takes a lot of hindsight. Right, and it isn't just the oh well, bad development, good development. It's it is uh, a lot about um, the community actually thinking 10, 20 years down the road and saying what are the patterns that we see coming, and how can we either stave those off? How can we benefit from that as a community? Right, because um, not all development is bad development. Actually, need to keep these pretty quick because we want to do a wrap up at the end. Um, I have a two parter, so that's not quick. Um, so, I am a uh, case manager that actually works on the east side of town in 202 with the uh, former Wheelie Courts, now East Meadows residents. Um, and so, uh, one thing mainly about schools um, first. Um, Bear County has a very fragmented school district system. I believe we have, correct me if I'm wrong, 27 districts. Is that right? There's such, there's such the county, like 17, in the 17 in the city. Okay. Um, and it's been that way for a while, and there's all this historical stuff with it. That's really interesting. But, um, and if you overlay that over these maps, um, you'll see that those lines of those school districts is almost directly over this low income and um, unemployment and all these different factors. Um, so I'm kind of curious if there are any opinions on policy changes with regards to school districts, uh, unifying, keeping them the same, or making them or even something. I don't know, your thoughts on yeah. it. 
Oh, uh, I, I'll take that because that's what I was going to close with anyway. Um, so, no, you're right. And so the same thing, if you look at all the dropout legacy neighborhoods, uh, Edgewood, uh, parts of South Sand, parts of SISD, none in Alamo Heights, none in the North Side, right? So we do have a disparity of districts. Um, Houston's the same way. Houston's a very fragmented city. And so from my perspective, and, and uh, Sean Reardon's a, another leading scholar, he's out at Stanford, and he has the same perspective as well. Uh, fragmentation is a problem, right? And so uh, the policy solution, my thing is, you have to untie the quality of school and education from the neighborhood someone chooses to live in, right? Uh, no one out here is choosing which neighborhood to live in based off of the water quality. Why? Because they assume there's going to be good water wherever they live. Why is it not the same thing for education? Right, we have all these websites now, great schools and, and Trulia and all these things that will give you the grade of the school. And what's happening, and we see this nationally as well, is that um, upper middle class individuals are choosing into better neighborhood schools and they are causing rapid in, uh, inequality, economic inequality. Right? And, and I can't blame them for making that decision. I have a, a close friend of mine who's making that exact decision. Knowing better, he knows what, what he's doing, but it's his kid, right? So in, in my uh, mindset, we have to untie where you live determines the quality of the education that you receive. And one of the ways that that happens, I think, is a centralized school district, right? Because no longer are we having uh, one school district building a multi-million dollar stadium while the other is struggling to get counselors, right? And I've seen it, and I know the reasons why Edgewood made those decisions, because of funding. They just don't have enough money. So if a nonprofit's gonna come in and provide similar services, then why not, right? But in, in my mindset, it's, well, why do we have to have this disparity in, in, uh, in these school districts, right? Even with recapture, even with the Robin Hood Act that Texas has passed, right? There is still this huge disparity, and not just in the amount per pupil, as Diego was saying, but in instructional uh, costs. You can look at Alamo Heights, and it's on their website, Alamo Heights and Edgewood, and the differences in what they pay in instructional costs per pupil. It's about three to $4,000 difference, right, where Edgewood is lower. And so even if we take out the multi-million dollar stadium, Alamo Heights is still, even with their $84 million of recapture in the last school year, they are still have a lot more money. And so, and that's not to like, you know, make uh, people who live in Alamo Heights feel bad about themselves. It's to say, you know, you are part of the county. You benefit from the city's development infrastructure. You benefit from San Antonio being on the map. It is about time that you realize that, right? And, and that you help the, in, in, in regard to the, the city as a whole, the area as a whole. And, um, and so with that, I feel like then you can start to provide uh, teachers and teaching aids in classrooms so there's not 30 students per kid. Because we know that, you know, uh, amount of students per teacher matters in educational attainment. And you can start resourcing uh, schools with counselors, right? I mean, that's a big part of what happened after Harvey is um, I helped to develop maps for the uh, Houston ISD to show exactly which students were affected and so that they can then provide counseling services for them, right? Um, but Houston Endowment stepped in and helped provide monies to provide counselors because they see the need for that, right? Um, and so, uh, in, in, in I, I think that still keeps the dignity of people who live in neighborhoods. You want to live in the West Side? Great, we want you to live here. As you're saying, there's many things that are awesome about living in the West Side, right? But we also want to provide a quality education. You deserve that as well. Your your kids deserve that, you're, right? And so, it, it's not about um, necessarily making the West Side look like Alamo Heights. No, it is about equality of quality right, in, in school. And so I think there's a direct cause and correlation, but I'm speaking that as a researcher, not as a policymaker, so. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the third rail for us, but if you guys are bored, I asked this question on social media two days ago, on Facebook and Twitter. I, I asked it in, in the universe. I said, tell me why it's a good idea to keep things the way they are with 17 school districts. I wanted to know what the benefits were, what people thought the answer was. There's about 450 comments now. You're welcome to read them. But I can tell you, generally, people want change. Um, 
it, it, it makes no sense for a city our size to have 17 school districts. Even if we dropped it down to seven, that would be an insane number. Um, but just to reiterate your point, because you made it earlier and it's really important. The lines that were drawn to create these school districts very much follow economic, purposeful, economic and racial segregation. And those lines, since those times, have not changed. We should be embarrassed that we still send our kids to the school in a system that bears such an obvious overt resemblance to that history. For that reason alone, we should undo it. I know it's complicated. I know politically it's hard. I know the people who are going to lose some of their seats. OK, and then what? It just does not make sense anymore for us to, to live in a city that is that corralled communities in this way. Um, and the result is exactly what you're talking about, what you're talking about, and I think, with, honestly, what the whole damn panel is about, right? So yeah, let's get rid of it. I'm not saying it should be one. I don't know if the answer is one or four or five. It's not 17. Diego, when I was growing up in every district, gosh, when I was growing up out there, there was at least one third Anglo. The school was at least, if not more. And that's the 60s. So it wasn't racially motivated. And most people worked at Kelly, had great jobs. What happened to Kelly? Employer, who closed that business? Okay, and we have some people waiting, so I'm gonna call call you up to talk about. He's gonna talk about dyslexia in education. Oh. Ma'am, we had another question. Yeah, but they've been in line. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, we're trying to. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Lois Holgain, and I'm from Decoding Dyslexia Bear County. And what I notice is that. No new information is brought forward. We're dealing with the same issues that we're dealing in the 30s and 40s. And how do I know? Because my dad grew up on South Presa in the 1930s and 40s. And San Antonio hasn't changed. Um, we just moved back to Bear County. And what I noticed was redlining. It's illegal. And it's still so active. My kids go to O'Connor High School. Yeah, I live in that 1604 area. And I started counting blacks. And I started counting the hijab. And I was like, where are the Oriental students? Where are the Indian? They're just not there. So it's one point. Dyslexia takes your numbers and makes it relevant. Because 80, 85 to 90% of your, your ninth grade dropout, your juvenile populations, your prison records, all are dyslexic students. I believe that we have a more concentrated body of non-readers in poorer neighborhoods. And while San Antonio is actually this year doing a pretty good job, um, I'd like you to look at um, San Antonio ISD has a 3.78 identification rate, and they let go of all their dyslexia teachers. What's dyslexia? If you're not a Spanish speaker, and if your IQ is not low, and you're not reading on grade level by third grade, the likelihood is you have dyslexia. Because the only thing that prevents kids from reading is a language issue or an IQ issue. Okay? Kids read. It's a difficult neurobiology. We weren't built this way. But the kids who aren't reading by third grade. So how many fourth graders aren't reading on grade level? 60%. Okay, your ninth grade dropout, your poor neighborhoods. Let's look at literacy rates. Beautiful programs in San Antonio. They all want to hand a kid a book and somebody who's going to read with them. But San Antonio ISD got rid of all of their specialists in teaching kids who struggle to read, they got rid of them. I'll tell you, Northside picked them up. The rich neighborhoods picked up the best reading specialists in San Antonio. They took them, while San Antonio ISD made the policy decision to get rid of them. So the thing is, is if you will look at the PEAMS data for San Antonio, what you're going to see is low reading level, which equal low success rate. It looks, it drives your populations into poverty, and it drives your populations into lack of success. So if you look at all your data and overlay it with dyslexia, you're going to see a strong need to do more dyslexia orientation. Sorry. 
thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that it's uh, getting better in FAISD from the standpoint that we are putting um, more attention to it. And there are, you know, other factors, of course, that contribute to the issue of 60% of fourth graders not being able to read. Um, if you see the, the research about the lack of vocabulary that many of our students um, enter pre-K and K with it, it explains some of that. But the point is taken, uh, there needs to be very serious attention given to the, the issues of dys dyslexia. It is a, a, a big need for uh, attention. And I think also on the part of parents that need to be educated about the whole issue of dyslexia uh, for the sake of the um, self-esteem of the student and, uh, and the understanding of even their classmates. Um, I, I see the suffering of students in the, in the, in the self-esteem department uh, because of their own not being able to understand why they're struggling so. And uh, many times the, the burden is on the teacher trying to discover how to get in to that child's uh, area of being able to learn to read. And, um, and too often we just pin it all on the child. Um, all right, so thank you for bringing up the issue. Um, I have more of a comment. Um, the more I learn about this topic, and I am still uh, very much in a learning status in my life and my career, um, I, I do, I'm from, I'm not from San Antonio, but I'm in the military. Um, I go to UTSA, and this was my class, we, uh, this was our project. I learned so much um, this semester about this particular issue, and every time I attend an event or have a discussion in class, um, I find myself just, just, just hearing from, from all of the comments is that we have a problem, everybody knows about it, and where to go from here, you know? If, if it's still in the developmental stage or still in the suggestion stage of the solution, I, I can't help because my mind doesn't let me rest every time this topic comes up. Why, why, why hasn't the city or, or, or does anyone ever consider, um, for lack of a better term, almost commercializing the culture? You know, what do you preserve, as, as what you said, you know, what do you preserve about the beauty of this population, about the beauty of these people that we can benefit from? We don't always have to, you know, sit and say, well, you know, we need to get money from, from the government for this, that, and the third. There is, there's such a beautiful thing about this culture that, that the world needs to know about. Um, and and it's, it's almost being snuffed out because the people who have the power and the money to make things better, they come in and they build these big high rises and it looks like something that's not representative of the population. What part of, um, or, or is there room in the solution to offer that, 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 that solution. How about we build places where, you know, the culture can preserve its dignity, the culture can preserve itself in the solution. We don't have to make an area or have to live in a city that's so big, that has so many resources, that forces people to go to these, to the crescent of comfort, because that's better. Why is there anywhere in this huge city that's unlivable? when you have so much potential, so much talent, so many people who are there, who live there, who can grow up if you just make it better for, for them where they are. That's a tough question. This whole discussion about equity is, is, is a lot to digest. To your point, as someone who's learning about um, the challenges that we face in San Antonio, but I will say that one of the reasons that is the way it is is because it has been, there have been generations upon generations of neglect in our community. There has been this stigma about our communities piled on over and over and over again. And even if you look at, you know, as far back as, as Jim Crow, Right when the, 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 the narrative that the government, the federal government, was passing down about communities like ours was that those are risky places to live. Those are dangerous places to live. And um, implementing policies that, that, that 
segregated communities and then define those communities in a really vicious way. And so I think even today we're 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 um, we're struggling with how we regain um, our identity and how we um, depict ourselves to the rest of the world about the history and the culture and all the good things that that come from from our neighborhoods um, because there is a lot of good there and you also touched and we've touched a little bit on the topic of gentrification right and I I feel like communities like ours sometimes are very easily gentrified um, in a bad way um, because of those stigmas and the institutionalized racism that exists in our neighborhoods that have silenced people, right? So I think in a way Patty was trying to say earlier that um, you need to speak up. And the gentleman said, well, we've tried that. Well, we haven't enough, right? When you have... Uh, for instance, a council district like ours, in District 5, where there are 110, 115,000 people, and during a municipal election, only three to 5,000 people come out and vote, right? Politicians and policymakers, they listen to that. That's called power, and we lack the power here. And when you have a lack of power and you pair that with the stigma of our community, then our voice is perpetually lost, and it's so hard to find it again. But that's why, and as we close, I, I think it's important to make sure that we are including as many voices as possible. Because when we talk about equity and we talk about these different um, ways of achieving progress, there, there seems to arise this culture of exclusion, right? Where we don't listen to certain people because maybe they don't have as much money, or they don't have as many degrees, or they don't, have a, they don't hold a particular title. But I'll tell you what, and, and I hope that people who create panels like this will keep in mind that there is a single mother in the Cassiano Projects who earns minimum wage, who is a single mom, who has faced abuse in her life, who could be sitting up here with us and give just as good a perspective as the rest of us up here, right? And so that, that, that is the culture we have to rebuild. And the only way that we get people to listen about who we are and we want to be and what we want to represent is by having a voice and engaging them. It's no longer okay to have so low and such low engagement in our city from the very people for whom we are trying to achieve equity for. Think about that, right? We're, we're trying to achieve equity, but the very people for whom we are proposing that are not part of the conversation, right? We grew up on the West Side, Geta and I and, and Diego, but it's like a professor told me at St. Mary's, when you got your degree, you are now part of the elite, right? As much as you want to connect yourself to that community and you, you'll try like hell to do it, you now have a responsibility to listen to people. And so we, we have to, as much as possible, attempt to raise those voices. It seems like common sense, but commonly sense isn't, isn't all that. Common sense isn't all that common sometimes. So we, we, we have to be able to do that in a, in a really targeted way. Thank you. We're going to have one last question, and then I'm going to summarize the questions that didn't get to be asked, and we're going to thank you for attending and hope that we do more of this in the future. This needs to be a much wider conversation with a lot more teeth to it. Here you go. Hi, y'all. Um, okay, so I am currently a senior at Keystone School. Um, I went to Edgewood for elementary school, and I left Ed Edgewood in fourth grade, and then two years later, the school that I attended, Coronado Escobar, was shut down due to lack of funding um, needed for repairs for the school. Um, fortunately, I've had the opportunity to have access to a quality education, but sadly, that was outside of West Side St. Antonio. Um, every day, I have to make the journey to Monta Vista in San Antonio to have a great education that makes me feel great about what I'm doing. It makes me feel like I can um, bring some change to my community. Um, but one thing that I wanted to, which is sad, by the way, the fact that I have to leave the West Side of San Antonio to do that. Um, but one thing I wanted to bring awareness to is uh, really the design aspect to where we are receiving our education. Um, you know, right now it wasn't until this meeting that I realized that the elementary school that I went to school in, that I was labeled as a GT student, this in like my entire like elementary career, um, 
you know, it, it was run down. And, you know, I often found myself bored a lot. Um, I was quite the misbehavior. Behavior. Um, I didn't have anything to do, and that was because whatever was around me in my classroom was falling apart. Um, it, I didn't have any motiva motiva motivation to, to go really to reach my potential, I think. Um, I had to work hard to get to Keystone School, but I think I would have had much more support if my environment, my school, um, the playground that I was in, or the park that I was, you know, that I wanted to go to was safe. Um, I just wanted to, to, to really point out that it's, it's more than just putting great teachers in a classroom or implementing great programs within a structure. Um, it's, it's also the structure that you're, you're having these activities in because the structure that you, you are currently in, such as the gym that we're in, it limits us in very many ways. And that is what architecture does for a city. And, you know, I, I listened a lot, and I, I really do want to uplift the west side of San Antonio, but how can we do that if, you know, our houses are falling apart? If we don't even have AC because it's too expensive? You know, like, how do we do that if literally the walls that we're looking at you know, like, it's hard to have dignity, it's hard to have pride, if that's all we see. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to raise awareness about. So, it's hard to close a panel like this that has been so interesting. I just really appreciate so much all of you coming and spending some of your precious time talking with us about it. I thank the panelists so much for giving their hearts and their minds to this topic. It just really feels like a conversation we need to be having in multiple other ways with the people who aren't here and in more assertive ways so that people understand this is our shared reality. It's not a reality you get to avoid because you personally were lucky enough to have a different set of circumstances. It's really sometimes only about that. So I feel like we've heard an awful lot about dignity tonight and making decisions based on preserving people's dignity. And I feel like that's a great word to take away from this night. And it's not often part of a conversation like this, but I'm just very appreciative that you came out, that you participated, that you put up with social work grad students trying to pull this evening off. And I think my classmates just did a wonderful job making this as welcoming and cool as possible. Thank you for NowCast SA filming what we were up to. And I just wanted to close with the last question, which anyone can pick up if they'd like, which one of the ladies had to ask, wanted to ask who wasn't able to, about what does an average person do to, to give more, to do more, to make a difference more? When poverty is a reality, when working is a reality, what does that really look like? Even if you, your desire is there, what can you do? And clearly we need way more macro solutions than that, like the city especially, and politicians and all the rest. But when an average person wants to get involved who's also suffering these circumstances, what, what's their next step? I'll start. Um, and actually, Richard stole the words right out of my mouth before I could answer a question that the, one of the last young ladies had, had talked about. It's engagement. I mean, just, and it's difficult, you know, we all were busy. We, you know, we have families we're raising, we have jobs, but engagement. And there's one thing that, you know, that it just has to be said in those four zip codes. And I don't know the exact data, but I know what it is in my, in my voting precinct. We don't vote. And I have heard it. I've literally heard this. Why can't we do this? Or why can't we do that? And I've heard it come out of politicians' mouth. Porque ellos no votan. Because those people don't vote. And it, it, it really goes back to being engaged and holding people accountable. I mean, that's one, that's one very easy way that you can make a difference is by voting for people who who, ought, who actually will make good decisions and make good policies because everything that we've talked about all goes back to policies, old policies. And they've continued to, you know, they've continued, continued to manifest themselves in the ways that we're seeing today. And so that's, that's 
one thing that I think is very powerful, and it's not just us, but encouraging and educating our neighbors, our friends, our family about why it's so important. And it's something that doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you know, maybe you know you don't have the you know the time or the energy or whatever it is to devote to you know a specific um, you know area to volunteer or to whatever it is. But one simple thing that you can actually do, and that we all have the right guaranteed by our constitution, is the right to vote. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off of that, I would say be be a disruptor, be someone who doesn't settle, right? Like, um, just for example, you're going to meet this. You know, I'm speaking more towards the, the younger folks in the audience as well that are, are thinking about career and college and that kind of thing. You're going to meet up against systems that are designed for you to be comfortable, that are designed for you to look away and be silent. For example, I get no academic credit or prestige for being here, right? Even though this, to me, matters more. They want me to talk to other academics only and publish in journals that no one's ever going to read. Um, and, and, but that's the system that's designed to keep the knowledge that I have to myself. And, and you're going to come up against things like that, but you have to choose to buck the system. You have to choose to come back to the community, to live, to engage to do all these things right like these are personal choices you can either uh you know as lily is saying right there's this crescent of comfort but there's also personal comfort that we can slip into and just be like you know what it's not my problem but um and, and that can be a personal thing that you just have to to kind of choose to you know i you know as a college student as a first generation student right i worked two jobs and help support my family and I still help support my family, right? Like, that's just part of my story. Um, but I'm happy for that, right? Because I have pride in that. And I know you do and everyone up here, right? That, um, but yeah, I, I think the, the idea is what uh, if somebody can do is just be a disruptor and constantly uh, be active and, and constantly be aware. I agree with you. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. I'm going to say this real quick. Um, I think voting matters, but honestly, in a lot of the areas we're talking about, we've elected people who echo all the sentiments of the people in the room, and there really hasn't been a whole lot that's changed, right? Um, and so, electing people who agree with you or are willing to say back to you what you say isn't quite enough. I think that what accountability looks like isn't so much just the vote, but it's the actual question, right? When people ask me what they can do, I can say, go to me or anyone else and say, this is an issue I care about, and I want to know two things. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do about it? What have you done? And then come back in a month or two or three or four and say, remember that conversation we had? And you can do this over email or the phone, because we're supposed to respond, right? And say, remember why I asked you about that thing? What are you doing about it? What have you done? And if you don't get a satisfactory answer, whatever their whatever one their public persona is and whatever their political party, if they're not answering the question, that's the accountability. The accountability is not just in the ballot box. It's in the fact that they're not responding in a real way to a question of someone that they represent. I feel like too many of us get away with saying the things you want us to say and acting like we really understand and then we sort of escape and don't do anything about it. And we come back and say, hey, we agree. Let me just say this great thing. We all, and I'm from the West Side, right? We're all cool here. I, I think accountability is different. I think it's what have they done. And I will, I will say it right now. There are lots of people who are elected with overlapping jurisdictions in areas like this and others that if you were to look at what they've actually done, and I'm not talking about a pilot program of $100,000. I'm not talking about one donation to a nonprofit. If you look at the policies that they've implemented or suggested that are designed to fix these problems, they don't, for the most part, exist. They aren't doing it. That is what we need to demand. Are you down or are you not? If you're not, then, then, right? Right. Uh, I thank everybody for their comments, and I, I agree with you. What I would add to it is, um, you know, in, in using your voice, I beg people to speak the truth. Um, some of you may be familiar with Saul Linsky. His teaching was behind organizations like COPS, 
and um, they, they, um, um, and his insistence on speaking the truth, I think, is very important. So to to assert the truth, speak up, be brave about it. Um, I, there's a little incident I talk about sometimes, just to emphasize the power of, of doing that. And when I was on city council, there was a street that the school district wanted to close. It was between the daycare center and the main school building because they had just built the early childhood center and they wanted the safety of the kids crossing the street. Well, some neighbors were upset and they were they were loud and they were, and they were vocal and they were up front. There was just a few of them, but they were loud. And it's not enough to just be loud. But, you know, it's not, you would think that everybody in the room didn't want to close that street until one mother in the back holding her child said, for the safety of my three-year-old, I'll go an extra block. I'll drive around an extra block for the safety of my child. And it turned the energy in the room. And those people who were afraid of those people that were loud started to speak up. And they got a little louder. And uh, you got to let people know who you are and, and that you're in the room. And you have something to say. So speak, speak the truth, be brave, speak up. Thank you. We keep wanting to share the same microphone. <laughs> um, uh, I, I believe wholeheartedly that um, words matter, right? And that the vocabulary that you use to promote whether it's progress or equity or whatever it is that, that you're promoting, is important. And um, one of the things that I try to do my very best everywhere I go is to, as often as possible, bring up certain words that are important to my goal and what I would like to see change. And that's why I make it a point to talk about dignity, right? Because I think that's one of the things that really helps move people in a certain direction, just a basic right, basic dignity, and talking about hunger and homelessness and poverty. Those are sort of the things that, that pull at what I at what I would like to see change in our city. And uh, Patty's probably looking at me and saying, "Well, I say all that stuff." Um, Patty's been a mentor to me, and I've been able to gather a lot of how I see the world and and um, and, and my experiences and put them to what I've learned from her and Rod. Um, but I think that's important wherever you go to tell people what you're passionate about, right? And, and, and put that human element to it because sure, we can be very data-driven, right? We're, we're a very data-driven society, but you need to make sure that you're always adding the human element. And that's why I'd say it's important to include as many voices as possible um, because I think even coming from an academic like Lily who brought up and said, dignity, we talked about dignity tonight, and that's what stood out to you, because that is the human element of, of our discussions, and that's important, I think, more important than anything. Let's give everyone a big round of applause, including the audience, for being kind enough to come tonight. Thank you so much. You can look on the website for more of the links, and we want to get our whole social work grad student class up here to take a photo with the panelists that our lovely YWCA hostess is going to do for us. So thank you so much for coming.